Uh, I would like to get started. It's late in the afternoon and uh, the topic is, sorry, I'm short. I forget that I have to adjust the, at least I can see over it. Um, it is late in the afternoon and I would like to give the panelists as much opportunity as possible and also the audience for discussion. Thank you for staying. Um, my name is Lily Gardner Feldman. I direct the program in society, culture and politics at the American Institute for Contemporary German Studies at Johns Hopkins University. Um, I was asked to chair this panel, I think in part because I work on international reconciliation, a term that has come up several times today. And I would like to say that a number of the questions that have been raised throughout the day are questions that have come up in my work over the past 40 years. They're the same kinds of questions, but obviously the answers in the German case are quite different. And it may be that we'll come to that later because Germany has been referenced a number of times since early this morning. Um, this panel is a continuation of the second panel uh, and it's entitled 2015 and its horrors, a century after 1915. And it tries, or we are trying to connect the distant past to the pressing present um, by undertaking three challenges. First, to identify what has changed and what has remained the same. Secondly, to address the deep-seated nature of conflict and the faint hope of reconciliation. And third, to consider the place that horrific historical acts have in contemporary relations. Uh, we've assembled an illustrious panel of experts who have a variety of perspectives on the subject matter in terms of professional training, in terms of places of origin. Uh, the first two presentations will deal with the Turkey-Armenia question directly, whereas the last two presentations uh, will broaden our scope to other conflicts and other responses to mass murder, but still suggesting a connection with the Turkey-Armenia topic. Uh, let me briefly introduce our speakers and their topics. Um, the first speaker is Arman Grigorian, an assistant professor in the Department of International Relations at Lehigh University. His research focuses on ethnic conflict, resulting in a wide variety of publications, including ethno-federalism, separatism, and conflict. What have we learned from the Soviet and Yugoslav experiences? and also third party intervention and the escalation of state minority conflicts. And finally, hate narratives and ethnic conflict, all of these very relevant um, to what we've been discussing so far. The presentation title is Between Understanding and Justification, Why We Should Not Fear Explaining Genocides. Our man will address recent advances in the study of genocide and the controversies inherent in the tension between positivistic and normative approaches to the problem. And then he will apply some of those general reflections to the debates surrounding the causes and the consequences of the Armenian genocide. Our second speaker, although he's sitting first, is uh, Amir Tashpinar. He's an expert on Turkey, the European Union, Muslims in Europe, political Islam, the Middle East, and Kurdish nationalism. He is a professor at the National War College and an adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. His extensive publications include two books, Political Islam and Kurdish Nationalism in Turkey, and Fighting Radicalism with Human Development, Freedom, Education, and Growth in the Islamic World. His presentation is entitled 2015 as a lost opportunity in which he will try to explain why the AKP has squandered a crucial opportunity in relations with Armenia, as well as in the approach to 1915 in the larger context of Turkish domestic and foreign policy. Our third speaker will be Hisham uh, Melhem. He is the bureau chief of Al Arabiya News Channel in Washington, DC. He speaks regularly at college campuses, think tanks, and interest groups on a variety of topics, including US-Arab relations, political Islam, and intra-Arab relations. He is also the correspondent for Anaha, the leading Lebanese daily. For four years, he hosted Across the Ocean, a weekly current affairs program 
on US-Arab relations for Al Arabiya. The presentation's title is The Persistence of Collective Memories, in which he will look at the treatment of minorities in Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon in the context of ethnic and religious conflict. And finally, we have uh, Catherine Guissin. She is currently on the faculty of the Department of Political Science at the University of Minnesota. She has also taught in the Netherlands, Austria, France, and Russia. She's published widely on the EU on reconciliation, including most recently a book entitled A Political Theory of Identity in European Integration, and her piece entitled Truth Telling and Right Speaking in European Integration Politics. Um, that piece will be appearing soon. Let me just apologize. I'm the third Brit at the podium. So in terms of overrepresentation, um, we're it. I think we represent 20% of all of the panelists. Um, so I apologize for that. Um, but let me uh, turn, please, to our man Gregorian. And thank you all for staying and for listening. And you have 15 minutes. <laughs> and I will give you a note. I won't pull you. I was going to say that uh, after hearing my own abstract for my presentation, I realized that I have certainly overcommitted and that, that I'm not going to be able to deliver that much in 20 minutes. And now it turns out that I have to deliver that much in, in 15 minutes. So that definitely I'm not going to do it. Hopefully some of the issues I want to talk about will come up in the question and answer session. So. What I want to talk about today is the recent or relatively recent advances in the study of genocide with a particular focus, and that is the, the relationship of the academic study of genocide, the social scientific, or you know, to use a more jargony word, the positivistic studies of genocide with kind of what our conventional wisdom is when we talk about genocide um, in political terms or in, in journalistic discourses, and also in some parts of academia, actually. Academia is not necessarily a place where all conventional wisdom is denied or rejected. So um, the conventional wisdom, let me begin with characterizing it, because that is going to be my my target, uh, hopefully not my straw man. But I think you would agree with me that when we hear any public conversation or journalistic narrative about the issue of genocide, there are probably two implied or sometimes explicit theories as to what causes genocidal violence in general. The first one is that it is hatred, and when we talk about hatred, or, or, or when I say we, when journalists talk about hatred, uh, they discuss it in, as, as, as some kind of an utterly pathological and apolitical phenomenon. It is a cause in itself. It is not a consequence of anything. The starting point of analysis, the, the, the point zero of analysis is, is the hatred itself. It is a cause. And uh, that is probably most common, the most common theoretical, implied theoretical argument about genocide. And there is an important corollary in, in hatred arguments about genocide, which has to do with um, the portrayal of victims as non-agents. They are pure victims. They are objects of violence. They have no agency whatsoever when it comes to genocidal violence. And this is very important because there is, uh, uh, an, an, again, an implicit concern that assigning any agency to the victims or talking about victims as uh, political actors in, in conflicts that result in genocide is going to amount to blaming the victims or diluting the issue of responsibility, etc. The second very popular and related argument uh, when it comes to explaining genocide in the conventional wisdom is theories that focus on exclusionary ethnic nationalism, kind of blood-based ideas of what constitutes the political community, the polity, and whoever is ex excluded from that definition 
is uh, slated for mass murder and violence. And these ideas were particularly popular in the, in the 90s when we were reading a lot of reports about what was happening in Yugoslavia and uh, you know, the conventional narrative about the conflicts in Yugoslavia was kind of this explosion of exclusionary Serbian nationalism. Again, it's a, it's a, a self-contained causal argument. A certain way an idea is defined about the political community and whoever is excluded gets, uh, sometimes gets targeted for mass murder, genocide, and ethnic cleansing. Now, um, the conventional wisdom actually was the earlier academic wisdom as well. I mean, if you look at the first gener generation of genocide studies, particularly in the post-Holocaust period, and particularly focused on the Holocaust, you know, there was a, an, an, a, a special emphasis on, on hatred, on pathological ideas that characterized not Nazi ideology. And Nazi ideology was considered sui generis and, and a self-contained cause of the mass murder of the Jews. And uh, Nazism was, of course, also considered a particularly noxious form of exclusionary nationalism. And hence, you know, it produced, you know, excluded outsiders which were slated for mass murder. Um, I think there is something interesting about the exclusionary nationalism argument, but not the way that the conventional wisdom describes it. And I'm going to return to it, but first let's talk about the hatred argument and what recent studies and the recent findings of social science, or relatively recent, they're not all very recent, but some of the interesting social scientific arguments against the hatred hypothesis are. First of all, I want to paraphrase Stephen Krasner, who is a political economist, and once he was talking, he, he was right, he, in one of his articles, he's talking about you know, uh, international trade, and uh, uh, he's discussing economists who argue that international trade is obviously the uh, the beneficial policy to have, yet a lot of you know, states have trade barriers. And, and the implied argument there is that you know, some states are stupid to have state barriers. And Krasner said stupidity is not an interesting analytical category. Uh, I want to argue that hatred also is not an interesting analytical category. It's not just a, a, a kind of category that can be easily used in social science. It begs for questions, where does hatred come from, right? Can we really separate hatred from a political interaction? Can we separate any emotion, any politically consequential emotion from political inter interaction? Uh, there are a series of questions one might also ask about this theory. Why hatred infects some groups and not others? Um, is it really true, and, and I want to make a, a special comment here about uh, the German case. Is it really true that the German hatred or German antisemitism was, was the most intense form of hatred and antisemitism in the beginning of the 19th century? I mean, if you were asked in 1910, where is the Holocaust most likely to happen in Europe, Russia probably would be a much better candidate than Germany. And if you were asked that during the Weimar period, you would probably rule out a Holocaust in Germany, right? Yet it is precisely in Germany where it happened, which was at the time uh, perhaps the most liberal of European societies, but um, it went to the other extreme in very quick order. So you, you obviously need other things to explain this sort of political violence. Hatred by itself is not going to give you much analytical leverage to understand it. Why does it happen in some historical periods and not others, right? Think about the Armenian case. I mean, you go to the mid-19th century, I know that the Turkish propaganda makes too much out of this, but there is uh, an element truth to the claim that in the mid-19th century, this is after the Greeks and Serbs have, have rebelled, and Armenians still haven't. Armenians are referred to by the Turkish elites as the, the faithful milliet, the, the faithful minority, right? And they're referred to, the, uh, to um, in, in such a form with, with considerable degree of affection, and then, you know, in a manner of a uh, few decades, Armenians become the most uh, feared uh, you know, threat to the integrity of the Ottoman Empire. There are all sorts of other arguments about the hatred hypothesis. 
you know, Eichmann in Jerusalem was mentioned, one of my favorite books. If, if there are five books that have changed me profoundly, Eichmann in Jerusalem is one of them. And, uh, and it's not just that one book. I mean, there are, there are other books that have made this, the same argument after Hannah Arendt or some even before her. And the argument there is that, you know, when you look at the actual perpetrators, you know, they're not, you know, they don't have horns, they don't have fangs. Most of perpetrators are ordinary human beings like you and me. So hatred and ideological distortions uh, and path pathologies are not necessary for understanding it. We are all capable of murder. You know, this is a very uncomfortable thought, but it has been demonstrated again and again by a lot of very good social science. One a uh, relatively recent book I would highly recommend reading is the book by Scott Strauss called The Order of Genocide about the Rwandan case. And he does a very careful statistical analysis of the different motives of the perpetrators. Hatred does not rank very high there. Finally, I want to point out that genocides are not committed by peoples. Genocides are committed by states, which also is in an uncomfortable relationship. This evidence is in, in an uncomfortable relationship with the hatred hypothesis. What about the exclu ex exclusionary nationalism argument? I mean, it is true as far as it goes, but it doesn't go too far, uh, or it doesn't go far enough either. First of all, we've had cases of mass murder committed by societies that subscribed to civic notions of nationalism uh, this society included, right? I mean, this is the civic nationalism par excellence, and this is also the society that has uh, mass murder in its past. Uh, the same can be said about Australians. Uh, you know, there are cases of exclusionary ethnic blood-based nationalisms that in some uh, periods of their history are, are quite violent and barbaric, like the Germans. And uh, the German, you realize that the German concept of nationhood has not changed from the Nazi period, right? It's, it's the same concept of what constitutes a German now as it used to be at the time, but you know, it would be uh, nearly blasphemous to compare modern Germany to the Nazi period. So they couldn't be more different, yet they are based, uh, th their ideas of nationhood are based on the same concept. So what is it that links nationalism to genocidal violence. Most studies of genocide point to the rise of mass politics. So it's not the ideology itself, but it's the rise of mass politics with modernization, and the rise of ma mass politics in states with intermingled populations and the un un unsettled issue of power, who controls the state and who controls what territory. So when you look at Europe, you, know, you had these multi-ethnic empires with intermingled populations, and you had the mass politics displacing old monarchies and old governments, and they had to settle the issue of power. And a lot of the conflicts, and a lot of the ethnic cleansing, and a lot of the violence happened exactly to settle those issues. Now, of course, not all intermingled populations produce genocide. Uh, there are a number of other hypotheses that help us understand which cases are most prone to genocidal violence and which cases are less prone. The, the issue of power is particularly complicated. So um, uh, I'll, I'll get to make maybe 25% of my points. Uh, so the most dangerous, yes, the most dangerous situations are not the ones when a group is completely and utterly powerless. This is another myth in the conventional wisdom. Um, groups that have a lot of power also are not in danger of being massacred or, or subjected to mass murder. It's the in-between cases where groups have some power, some influence, and uh, you know, yet they're vulnerable as well. And what is also very important to, to understand, and this is what demonstrates, uh, what is uh, clearly uh, demonstrated by the evidence, is when these power relationships change. So if you look at a lot of the cases of mass murder, these are committed by states, not all of them, but quite a few of them, including the, uh, the, the Armenian case, uh, they are committed by states in decline and, and in fear of losing, in fear of, um, of, of uh, these minorities 
forming alliances with, with others and, and rebelling against them. So, you know, uh, states in decline are a lot more uh, vulnerable to this kind of policy or are, are a lot more prone to this kind of policy. Now let me just make one point which I, I really care, uh, care about and uh, I'm, I'm going to stop after that. One of the most common um, arguments, one of the most common prescriptions as to how to deal with ethnic cleansing, mass murder, ethnic conflicts is make states more democratic. Democracy is seen as the panacea. Democracy, of course, is the secular ideology of the, or, or the secular religion of the West, and everybody loves democracy as everybody loves uh, motherhood and, and apple pie. Now, and, and when we compare what's happening in the modern Middle East, we think the problem is the lack of democracy there, or at least in, in some parts of the Middle East where these sort of conflicts are, are happening today at a very, very high intensity. And we're comparing them with peaceful Europe where minorities are respected, where um, you know, minority rights are guaranteed, where there are constitutions, checks and balances, etc. Now, um, a lot of the recent social science raises questions about these sort of static correlations. You look, you take, you know, democracies and you take non-democracies, compare their treatments of minorities. Clearly, democracies treat their minorities better. Uh, case closed. Some people have raised the issue that a lot of modern democracies have gone through a similar process that the modern Middle East is going through. They have already gone through their ethnic cleansings. They have already gone through their forced assimilations and defeating their minorities. And now, uh, you know, they're democratic because they can afford to be democratic. Now, I'm going to conclude by, t uh, by an anecdote, which you might find um, maybe funny, although this is not a funny subject. Uh, there is a wonderful book by Michael Mann, who is a, soci a political sociologist at UCLA. Uh, he, he, the book is called The Dark Side of Democracy. And in it, he makes this point exactly. And once he was at a panel and people challenged him on that and they make, made the, uh, the observation that actually if you're talking about static correlations, democracies are better in, when, when it comes to the treatment of minorities. So Michael Mann hesitated how to answer this and you know, he didn't have a good answer and, and I knew what his answer should be so I raised my hand and I'm like, okay, uh, Michael Mann he, he, Michael Mann's argument is correct. It's the title of his book that is wrong. It should have been the bright side of ethnic cleansing. Uh, so I, I did have other things about the moral implications of the positivistic, uh, uh, positivistic theories of genocidal violence. Actually, that was supposed to be the most important thing I was going to talk about, but I don't have time. I hopefully will return to it in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you all for staying. I know it's late, it's getting late, so I'll try to be very brief and uh, hopefully try to answer questions if uh, you decide to stay even longer. Uh, what I'll try to explain, what I'll try to talk about is uh, why there is a uh, disconnect between what we're discussing here in terms of uh, the genocide and the debate in Turkey. And there is indeed a uh, main disconnect, and I, I would like to underline this because uh, if genocide recognition is the first step towards reconciliation, uh, we have indeed a major disconnect uh, in what we're discussing here and what is happening in Turkey. Uh, we can basically find some optimism. We can believe that there is movement in the right direction because 10% of Turkey is talking about uh, what happened to Armenians. There is a growing uh, uh, recognition among some civil society groups that what happened uh, was tragic. Uh, even the term genocide is no longer exactly a taboo. But make no mistake, in the mainstream of Turkey, uh, you don't have really a sense of collective guilt. And what you need to have, in my opinion, and I'll try to be deliberately provocative here in comparing with the Holocaust, without a sense of collective guilt, there will never be a sense of genuine recognition and a genuine apology for what came to be called genocide. I would even argue that instead of collective guilt in Turkey, what we have is a collective sense of victimhood. 
In Turkey, in fact, the debate is not about what happened to Armenians, but often when Armenians are being talked, immediately the sense of victimhood in Turkey kicks in, and it can be summarized in the form of who remembers the Turks, who remembers the Armenians who were killed, who remembers what happened in the Balkans, in the Caucasus. Why aren't we talking about all the atrocities, all the uh, deportations, all the ethnic cleansing that happened uh, against Muslim communities, and we're focusing on Armenians. That's the sense of collective victimhood that you have in Turkey, and without finding a solution to this sense of collective victimhood, I think we will not get really ahead in our attempt to push Turkey towards genocide uh, recognition. We may find English-speaking Turks, progressive Turks, liberal Turks, democratic Turks, who will apologize for what happened, who will feel a sense of guilt. But uh, what, if what we're looking after is an apology from the government, a sense of recognition from the government, a sense of guilt from mainstream Turkish society, we're definitely not there yet. And we're not there yet because the main narrative in Turkey is primarily about a sense of victimhood and a sense of resentment towards the West. And increasingly, my worry is that uh, we have a government in Turkey which portrays these attempts by foreign governments to genocide recognition in their parliaments in the framework of Islamophobia. They don't like us because we're Muslim, in the framework of Turkophobia, in the framework of Orientalism. Muslims have committed atrocities against Christians. There's this perception of injustice done to Turks, injustice done to Muslims. That's the main narrative, I think, which resonates with still the majority of Turkey. And uh, in terms of reconciliation, if reconciliation on the Turkish side would take people to acknowledge that what happened was a genocide, uh, we have to think about what would reconciliation on the Armenian side uh, would entail. In other words, if the Turks have to move forward a little bit by saying that, okay, what happened was a, dis was a disaster, it was a tragedy, in many ways, the Armenian communities were annihilated. That's movement in the right direction. However, ac acknowledging the genocide, because of the toxic nature of the term, is still very difficult because we, whether we like it or not, the genocide comes with a baggage. It's very difficult for officials or civil society groups or Armenians in the diaspora or for the Armenian uh, government to say, Genocide recognition will not entail some form of compensation, some form of reparations. There will always be a perception in Turkey, and perception is reality, that acknowledging the genocide will come with consequences. It will come with consequences related to compens uh, uh, compensation, territorial or financial. Therefore, you may have a Turkish government which one day who may decide to apologize for the decimation, annihilation, uh, destruction of Armenian communities, but the term genocide itself, what we're discussing today, is very difficult for the Turkish government or the Turkish mainstream to accept. Historians may agree, historians may come to terms with ha what happened, but for a government and for mainstream society to recognize what happened as genocide to occur, I think that's, a main, uh, that's the main obstacle. In terms of uh, what about the debate in, of Armenia? What can the Armenian communities uh, uh, do in terms of helping Turkey to come to terms with history? Well, uh, here in this uh, uh, conference, uh, I heard uh, a couple of times terms like Turks are not genocidal. It's not in their DNA to commit genocide or the fact that Turks basically are not predisposed genetically to kill. Well, that, that, that's a good start. But at the end of the day, that, that's not going to really move forward the debate in terms of Turkey's sense of empathy with Armenia or Armenians. Of course, Turks are not genocidal. Of, of course, Turks are not genetically predisposed to killing. It's not in their DNA. There's a context to this. But the minute you try to bring the context dimension, then you're labeled as a denialist. This is why I think we have to be more liberal in the context and the use of the term genocide. The term genocide is a very toxic term, but if we could talk about what happened to the Turks in the Balkans, what happened to the Muslims in the Balkans as genocide as well, if we could talk about what happened to the Muslims 
in the Caucasus as genocide as well, maybe there would be more of a symmetry to this. But we're not there yet because what happened, because the term genocide technically defined, as we heard this morning, is when one state is engaged. Although I'm not sure whether exactly this is how it should be defined, but there is a sense that if a state commits violence against a minority, that's more prone to be a genocide, whether when there is an intercommunal fight and when there is basically a, a, a civil war context and two ethnic groups are fighting and there is mass killings, we're reluctant to call it a genocide. In other words, when a uh, uh, Serbian uh, uh, a nationalist or Greek nationalist or Bulgarian nationalist or Russian nationalist kill uh, Muslim minorities, well, if it's basically in the, con in the absence of a Serbian state, in the absence of a Bulgarian state or a Russian state committing these uh, killings, we can't call it a genocide. That's the kind of technical difficulty in terms of what is a genocide. And Turks feel singled out that they have committed genocide, but what happened to them is somehow is not genocide and it's mass killings. And I'm saying this in order to project the debate in Turkey. Because in the mainstream, this is the kind of arguments you, you're likely to get. Uh, the term genocide is a very toxic term. And ter there's a reason why the Turkish government uh, or Turks are okay with the term ethnic cleansing or tragedy or decimation, annihilation of Armenians. The minute you, you use the term genocide, however, it turns into a different debate. That's why the genocide itself as a concept is turning into a, uh, a toxic obstacle for progress in terms of reconciliation. Finally, why 2015 is a lost opportunity? Well, I had high hopes when the AKP came to power almost uh, 13 years ago that we could move forward in terms of <coughs> democratization in Turkey, in terms of coming to terms with history, in terms of liberalization. And indeed, this government, uh, the AKP government, has done more than previous Turkish governments in terms of uh, changing the political vocabulary. Condolences. That's an important step to talk about shared pain. My favorite uh, soundbite of this conference was shared pain, from shared pain to champagne, although you would never have really AKP officials uh, toasting champagne. But they would, they, they re, there was an attempt by Davutoglu uh, and the likes to say, look, let's talk about the collective sense of agony, the collective tragedy. That's, that was at the heart of the clumsy attempt to put Gallipoli at the heart of the centennial, to say, look, we, we should not be talking only about the Armenian tragedy, but let's talk about all the sufferings. Of course, this, this did not work, because the Armenians rightly would say, yes, you have suffered, a lot of Muslims have suffered, but..." How can you use this as an excuse for the genocide? How can you use this as basically an attempt to uh, alleviate the agony of the genocide? But this is as much as tolerance you would get from the Turkish government in terms of trying to change the vocabulary. This was a first step, but it did not go too far. It did not really achieve what it was intended to achieve, which was dialogue with Armenia, opening the border with Armenia establishing diplomatic relations. As if coming to terms with 1915 is not difficult enough, you have, as we discussed in the previous panel, all the geostrategic issues surrounding Turkish-Azeri relations, Russia, uh, the geostrategical dimension of Turkish-American relations. So you have a number of complicating factors which have transformed 2015 into a lost opportunity in terms of Turkey coming to terms. And finally, I would like to say also that when you look at the Turkish political agenda, we can spend a day on the Armenian genocide here talking about why, it, why Turkey is, uh, is unable to come to terms. But when you look at the Turkish political agenda, the issue of 1915, the issue of genocide, is simply not in the top five or six or seven items that is being discussed in the country. The political agenda of Turkey is so loaded from the urgent situation of what's going to happen with the Kurdish question to the question of Islam, secularism, the fight between AKP and the Gulen community, the question of Syria, what's going to happen to basically Turkish relations with uh, the, the region, Turkish-Israeli relations, Cyprus, EU, that Armenia has a hard time, the, the issue of 1915 has a hard time entering the loaded Turkish political agenda. We're not discussing this issue in Turkey. 
The only time this issue is being discussed in Turkey is in the context of foreign governments basically passing resolutions. You, would, you wouldn't have a debate in Turkish TV, in Turkish parliament, in Turkish academic circles without April 24th, without the pressure coming from external dynamics, simply because there is a political agenda in Turkey, there is a loaded political agenda, domestic agenda, which uh, dominates uh, the urgent uh, uh, issues, which basically leaves no room for Turkish intellectuals, uh, Turkish politicians, Turkish civil society to really go to the heart of the matter and discuss what happened 100 years ago. There is no sense of urgency to this debate. And this is why I, I believe 2015 at the end of the day was a lost opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not a historian. I'm not a historian of Turkey or Armenia. I was recruited to come here because of my experience and because of an article I've written, um, the title of which was The Twilight of Middle Eastern Christianity. I'm a journalist. I'm one of those people who write the first draft of history that later on professional historians botch and rewrite. But uh, I'm here essentially to talk about my own experience and what I call the persistence of collective memories. But let me start with a couple of caveats. I come from a region where in the last hundred years, since the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, since the birth of this crazy architecture that we refer to as Sykes-Picot, which is collapsing right now, because what we see today is the fraying of the political order that emerged after, after the collapse of the Soviet Union and the uh, return of Western colonial powers. What we see today, uh, what we're going through today in the Middle East is similar in many ways to what happened in 1915 in the sense that there's a huge, we're going through a huge, hellish, huge but hellish transition. And I'm always, when I watch the situation in the Middle East, I'm always reminded with what uh, Antonio Gramsci said about the nature of transition. I'm a former, former leftist, so I feel compelled once in a while to, to, uh, to quote uh, my old fellow uh, travelers at that time. Uh, Gramsci says, the crisis consists in the fact that the old is dying, the new cannot be born yet, and in the interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. A great variety of morbid symptoms appear. What we see today in the Arab world, in the Middle East in general, is these morbid symptoms. And they're going to last with us for a, stay with us for a long time. Uh, but let me start with a couple of caveats, as I said. One, uh, one is, because I come from that part of the world, and because I meet victims, and because many of us swallow in victimhood, and many of us elevated their pain into the uh, level of mythology, I hear a lot of talk about, they, they, may not, they may not phrase it as eloquently as I do, as the, the hierarchy of pain, that there is a, some sort of a hierarchy of pain, that my pain is more uh, genuine than yours. I don't believe in, aris in the aristocracy of pain. There is no such thing as the aristocracy of pain, even for those who have been at the receiving ends of horrific violence. And we know many of them in the Middle East. So that's, let, let, let's make that clear. The other one is guilt. Growing up Catholic in Beirut, I know something about guilt. I believe in moral responsibility. I don't necessarily believe in inherited collective guilt. Those Germans during the Nazi Holocaust and the Nazi horrors are responsible morally because they, have not, they, they did not do enough those quote unquote ordinary Germans that Hannah Arendt spoke about and other people, historians spoke about. But I do believe that societies should own their history just as individuals own their previous past. We cannot escape it. Own it. That's, that's the problem that I think the Turks today are still struggling with. They, we can talk a lot about what genocide means and whether it is an annihilation or ethnic cleansing, mass murder. But essentially, are they owning their history? Even if it was Ottoman before the Republic and before Ataturk, 
And that's, that's, that's really one of the questions. We really do not have to go back to 1915, to the horrors of 1915, to talk about denial. Now, most people, most individuals, don't do introspection well. Most people don't engage in self-criticism. But what goes for individuals goes for societies and cultures and states. Just as individuals seek refuge in denial when they are faced with unpleasant realities, things that they have done and committed, states resort to a refuge in denial. And that's what we have in the Middle East. I don't have to go back to 1915, to what the Turks did to the Armenians and to uh, Syrians and to others, or what other people did to the Turks and, and uh, other groups. Uh, you know, horrendous things happened to everybody. I, in my lifetime, in my lifetime, there were Arab leaders who were accused of committing mass murder or crimes against humanity. Saddam Hussein, Omar al-Bashir in Sudan, Muammar al-Qaddafi. I struggled with fellow Arabs because I used to be one of the few who would dare go on, on CNN and talk about the genocidal war that was being waged against the Kurds by the Iraqi regime. It was a state that was doing this. And I was vilified. There was no outcry. There was no outcry in the late 1980s. Most of us were around in the late 1980s when Saddam was committing these mass murders, you know, uprooting thousands, I mean, tens of thousands of Kurds demolishing their culture and their history and their heritage and killing them physically with gas. There was no outcry in the Arab world. Well, the Turks, at least today, can, you know, there are many Turkish intellectuals and scholars and great, you know, journalists and, you know, including my, my friend, Omar, who talk openly, who own, who try to, to say we own, we should own this thing and talk about it. I have yet to see many Arab intellectuals, Arab, talk about what happened to the Kurds or what, what, what happened to the people in Darfur or the atrocities that are taking place in Syria today, especially on the part of the left. It's incredibly shameful. So I don't have to go back to 1915 to talk about this. But when I was looking, you know, when, when, I, when I wrote that article, and let me backtrack to say a few things about, about my, ex my, my relationship, my personal relationship with the Armenians. I grew up in an Armenian neighborhood. I went to school with Armenian kids. I learned, I heard the stories. And actually on, on April 24, the whole town, I mean the whole city, Beirut was closed down because, you know, we had, we had so many successful, you know, small business, uh, Armenian-owned uh, businesses. And so I, I became familiar with the Armenian tragedy, you know, when I was 10, 11, 13, 14. At a time when, when I, you know, at that age, I used to converse in Armenian. And, and, and I even learned a few Turkish words from the elder Armenians who used to converse among themselves in, 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 in Turkish. And I still remember some of the beautiful cuss words. And I, but although, although the Arabic language is very, I mean, we, we, we take no second you know, place to anybody when it comes to curses in Arabic. It's very rich. Um, so I grew up with Armenians, and I heard the, 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 the horrors of 1915. The interesting thing is, I had my own horror story. My father died when I was 11. My father was a lone child. His mother survived him. Her name was Martha Sassin. She had one of the most beautiful old faces you would ever see. I worship that woman. She used to put me next to her, comb my long hair. Always had long hair, believe me. I used to have a long hair. <laughs> I grew up and I mellowed and I lost it. Um, she would comb my hair and tell me what happened to my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, her husband. Elias Milham. I still can't talk about it. 
The retreating Turkish army collected all able-bodied Christian men in Lebanon, Syria, and Palestine during the so-called Sefer Berlik, which is what in, in Turkish mobilization, right? Yeah. They took them to Anatolia. One of them is my, my grandfather to do slave labor. Many of them perished, many of them died. Some managed to flee and went through the Syrian desert and ended up going back to the, my, my family hails from Northern Lebanon. I was born in Beirut, but my family hails from the mountainous part of Northern Lebanon. He arrives diseased, you know, because uh, I, I, you know, they, you know, he told them that they used to collect you know, dead bodies on trains and it was horrible. He, I think, stay, uh, survived for two or three months and then he passed, he, he died. So I grew up listening to my grandmother, whom I worshipped, telling me what those Turkish monsters, that these are, that's her words, did to your grandfather. She would cry and I would cry hysterically. I worshipped that woman. And talk about hatred and talk about demonization. I never met a Turk in my life. I mean, I'm still a little kid. I brought these memories with me. That's why I want to talk about the persistence of collective memories. Then I came to the United States in 1972. With the passage of time, I began to learn history, learned about the history of the Ottoman Empire, met wonderful Turks, and fell in love with Istanbul when I went there. It took me a long, 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 painful time to get over my personal demons when it comes to Turks. And today I'm proud of my friendships with a lot of Turks, including this man here. But it took, and I'm lucky, and I'm lucky because I got, got out of that trap. And yet, intellectually, I made my peace. And yet, it's still in my gut. It's still under the skin. Because I learned the, the tragic family history from a woman I, I worshipped as a little boy. When I look now to what's happening in the Middle East, Again, you see flashes from 1915 and, 20, and 2015. Death marches in the deserts. In 1915, it was the Armenians. Death marches in the deserts. In 2015, the Yazidis and the Assyrians and the other Christians. In, 19, in 1915, you had the famine in Lebanon, which is mostly man-made. Lebanon and Syria, but mostly in Lebanon. And you've seen the grainy black and white pictures and photos of emaciated kids and women mostly. A few weeks ago, one Lebanese paper published a number of new, apparently, pictures. And it brought tears to my eyes. They were so reminiscent of what's taking place in Syria today, in the Armouk camp, where Bashar al-Assad is using medieval tactics of siege and famine, starvation. And you've seen pictures of emaciated women, mostly. It's always the Im images of emaciated kids and women, children and women. And there were horror stories about people eating grass, getting religious edicts to allow them to kill cats and you know, these roaming cats and, and dogs that are extremely you know, skinny. I don't know how they eat them. And again, the only difference is that these photos are in color. And they are clear. Unlike the grainy black and white photos of 1915, of Armenians, of Christians, of you know, those who were victimized by the, that man-made, mostly man-made famine. And again, the same demonization. And uh, the same violence and the same denial. It is good to have collective memories if, 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 if we use them as a cathartic thing to honor the memory of those who died, but not to use them politically for revenge, not to commercialize them, not to make political careers out of exploiting them as politicians do, as intellectuals do, because they want to perpetuate that aristocracy of pain. 
And this is what we have today in the Middle East. What, what really makes it so tragic today is that there is an old woman today an Assyrian woman or a Yazidi woman who will be telling her 10-year-old boy what happened to his father. Or there is a father who will be telling his daughter that her mother was killed, probably raped and then killed. And we are going to go to another cycle of another century where this collective memories will be uh, told and retold, passed on from one generation to another. And many of those th pe people may not be as lucky as I am to get out of that cycle, to liberate yourself or myself or themselves from that burdensome collective memory of pain and victimhood. Because there are people who are going to perpetuate the, 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 the victimhood. There are people who are going to exploit it for political reasons or for cultural reasons or for whatever. And the problem with collective memories, they don't die easy. I come from a region where the Shia of today, when they commemorate the death and the martyrdom of Hussein, Imam Hussein, it happened yesterday. I see tough men who would kill you in a battle, become like a little kid, weeping and crying when somebody sings a story about Hussein or Ali, his father, who was also killed. These tough men become like little kids. It happened yesterday because you talk about it on and on and on and on at the mosque, the imam, at home. And you do reenactment. I'm a Virginian by choice. I worship Abraham Lincoln. I call him my secular saint. Jefferson is my man. On the 4th of July, I read the Declaration of Independence every year. Then I drive in the hilly roads of Virginia and blast the radio, listen to the blues and say, thank God I ended up in America. But being Southerner by choice, I have a funny affinity to Robert E. Lee because of victimhood. Defeated people have long, long memories. Victims have long, long memories. And they perpetuate them. And they reenactment. They do reenactment. I once read a wonderful piece on the history of Arab theater. One reference to Arab theater was the reenactment of the killing of Imam Hussein in Karbala, where he was killed along with 70 of his Ansar supporters. And the writer was beautiful, describing a situation in a village that had mostly Shia, but some Sunnis. He said, you know, throughout the year, things are good between the Sunnis and the Shia. The closer we get to Ashura, where we do the commemoration, we have a group of people who represent uh, Imam Imam Hussein on horses or whatever, and these people are attacked by another group. I mean, they, they stage it the way we do civil war reenactment. I'm a civil war history buff. I know what I'm talking about. I wrote about this. Probably I'm the only one who writes about the civil war to an Arab audience. I've done work for, for, for BBC uh, in television. I even thought about I, 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 I ride horses. so I, I'm, <laughs> I have a Palomino, and they said, look, a Palomino, they shoot you because, you know, usually generals don't, don't write Palominos. Palominos are, anyway, let's forget about that. And then, but, but the interesting thing is if you have these people live together, and the closer you get to Ashura to the day of commemor commemorating this tragedy, tension begins to build up. Then you have this tension between these people who lived with each other, okay, throughout the year. Emotional build up to the day where they stage the event, the killing, the ambush, and the killing of this great man, Hussein, Imam Hussein. And then those who are play the role of the killers of Hussein are usually sometimes, because when people get that frenzy into a frenzy, they stone them, and they are their neighbors. 
100 years after the end of the, uh, more than 150, now we are celebrating the, uh, commemorating the 150th anniversary of the American Civil War, the bloodiest conflict in American history. And we are still living in the shadow of the American Civil War 150 years ago. I have elder friends, people my age or older than me from Virginia, and we, I usually take them to Antietam. I give them a lecture about Antietam, believe me. I know it so much. And they still feel in their gut that we have been wronged in the South. Victims don't forget easy. During the killing of, of, of the 1990s in Kosovo and Bosnia, Slobo Milosevic invoked that dark day and the plains of the blackbirds. When was it? 1380 something? When the Ottoman uh, Turks annihilated essentially the Serb army. It was a horrendous event. It became the stuff of folklore and mythology and songs. And it happened yesterday. American Civil War, the Sunnis and the Shia, Slobo and the Serbs, you name it. Perpetuating victimhood, not dealing correctly with collective memories. And my fear is that we are creating a new generation of Sunnis and Shia and Yazidis and Christians and Assyrians who are going to pass these horror stories of pain and victimhood and, 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 and create another cycle of collective memory that will stay with us for another 100 years. And unless we deal critically with the whole concept of collective memory as something that we can use effectively to cleanse our history. You know, the Germans did the wonderful job. Sometimes they, we, yesterday we were talking about they may, they may have gone too far in, in self-flagellation. South African did something very interesting and very, very commendable that my people, the people I, 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 I grew up with my, in Lebanon, still refuse to do. Until this moment, the Lebanese never owned the civil war, their civil war never owned their own massacres. They still say, well, it's this, depending on your view, it's the Syrians, it's the Israelis, it's the Palestinians. We were, you know, we were caught in the middle. They made me do it in a way. It's like the devil made me do it. They don't want to own it. And, that, and that's to their shame. And we have the same thing in Syria now. And we're gonna have the same thing in Iraq and the same thing in the Sudan. And we never learned. And we never learned. Collective memory. Persistence of the collective memory is good only if you know how to use it. We can really suffocate you. And I'm glad, personally, I escaped that. Thank you. Thank you. Well, you are all a very hard act to follow. And here I have a privilege of a last word. My presentation is entitled, For the Sake of the Survivors, What Kind of Justice and Reconciliation? I would like to draw from transitional justice and the early years of European integration as a reconciliatory process to examine the Turkish-Armenian relation in a comparative manner rather than as a single and exceptional case. Why transitional justice and the early years of European integration? Because these policies both started as responses to genocide as mass massacres of World War II. I hope that this somewhat iconoclastic approach will stimulate the work of imagination, which is so needed in the case of frozen conflicts. Hannah Arendt called imagination neither mere reflection nor mere feelings, but the gift of the understanding heart. King Solomon was one example she cited as he dealt with the two mothers fighting over the same baby. Imagination, she wrote, makes it bearable for us to live with other people, 
strangers forever in the same world and makes it possible for them to bear with us. Let me start with a few remarks about transitional justice. Its theory and practice should prod Turks, civil society, and the state to feel less defensive as their country has joined the rather large club of countries being held accountable for past misdeeds. Most shriek in protest, and my country of origin, Switzerland, certainly did, when it was challenged by external pressure to reopen bank accounts of Jews it had closed after the war and to return money to the descendants. But the Swiss policies changed. A comparative perspective might thus hel help alleviate the so-called Sèvres syndrome, the sense that Turkey is uniquely singled out for persecution. Moreover, historical experience teaches us that truth-seeking and atonement must be pursued for their own sake, not to gain international support. International recognition of German efforts, efforts excuse me, came long after the whole process had started. For current scholarship, transitional justice rests on four pillars. I suggest that we can consider these four pillars as four standpoints of four analytical categories from which to assess the Armenia-Turkish relationship. The first pillar consists of domestic and international trials. The second of truth and reconciliation commissions. The third aims at psychological healing of victims and perpetrators. And the fourth consists of reparation. For instance, we might examine systematically the whole process of meeting out justice by reviewing trials or what stood in for trials, from the Ottoman trials of 1919 to the attempts by Armenians to take justice in their own hands in the 1920s, in 1973, and 1983. When are terrorist acts justified, we might ask. We might examine, in light of similar processes elsewhere, the process of truth-seeking and atonement which started in the last decade in Turkey. What is the role of literature in processes of healing? Should Fethiye Setin bestseller, My Grandmother, an Armenian Turkish memoir, be considered in this light? Coming to reparation, Tanner has also suggested a comparative approach. Is there a statute of limitation on reparations? Obviously, people disagree about this. Certain gesture without being necessarily described as reparation, can stand in for reparations, and I will dare make one practical suggestion. There are presently perhaps as many as 100,000 illegal workers from the Republic of Armenia in Istanbul. This number fluctuates seasonally. Since 2011, their children have been allowed to attend Armenian schools but they cannot receive school living diplomas because they are not Turkish citizens. Could this policy change as a form, if not of reparation, at least of recognition that these children have a historical and special link with Turkey? I simply raise this question as a possibility. I turn now to the early years of European integration as a reconciliatory project. What are relevant features to our case? I do not suggest in any way that this process is a perfect process of reconciliation. Rather, we should look at it to stimulate the imagination, a bit like we might study the South African process. My definition of reconciliation comes from our chair, Lily Garner Feldman. Reconciliation and peace do not mean the final elimination of conflicts, but rather the transformation <laughs> into productive contention in a shared and cooperative framework. There are enormous differences, of course, between the Western Europe of the early 1950s and Turkey and Armenia today. I would like to argue, however, that recollection of past atrocities and even re reparations may not hold by themselves 
the best premise to found the new in politics. Rather, the painful work of identification with the other, materially and psychologically, is more effective and lasting. Let me discuss briefly how this worked out in the early years of European integration. First of all, the victim took the initiative. Second, shared policies and institutions were crafted with a view to establish balance and even equality among the partners. And third, small countries took decisive leadership at moments of crisis. So first, the victim took the initiative. France had been occupied three times by German troops in 70 years. The French initiated Schumann Declaration acknowledged that France had failed in its efforts to create peace. There was no finger pointed. Europe without distinction was called to overcome its sanguinary division. The main concern was forward looking to establish peace, democracy, and prosperity. Unwittingly, perhaps, the French initiators understood something Hegel had theorized 150 years earlier under the shock of Napoleonic invasion, which provoked the collapse of the Holy Roman Empire. In his famous metaphor of a master and slave, Hegel argued that in an unequal and conflicting relationship, both parties gain from changing their relationship because it defines not just their material interest, but also their respective identities. And who wants to be defined forever as a slave master? Because the victim has most interest in changing the relationship, it takes the initiative. Liberation takes place in the world of work and economics. The slave fights for mastery over the fruit of its labor, and if a fight is successful, the master is liberated from the status of mere consumer. But liberation also takes place in the minds of the enemies. As the slave comes to see the master as a human being for the first time, it becomes a human being to the master. Although the French-German relationship was not exactly that of a master-slave, some French people managed to shift from victimhood to agency, both in civil society and at the elite level, which came to a great surprise to international observers then. In the mind of European founders, like the American founders, the right kind of institution would train people into new behaviors. They would hold in check overweening nationalism. This was a very tall order when you think of Luxembourg in comparison with West Germany or France. It took almost four years of negotiation between 1950 and 1957 to craft the three founding treaties and to imagine what would become known as the community method of decision making. Initially, uh, incidentally, this method has been shared, shed in the European and economic community. But going back to that method, it included a careful weighing of votes in all institutions with a view to advantaging the small. Primacy and direct apl applicability of law decided by European institutions. Rotating leadership among partner nations by alphabetical order. Careful use of multilingualism. And I will leave it at that. A certain economic equality must also be maintained between France and Germany. And Germany already in 1950 was taken, taking over France in steel production. Coal and steel being the backbone of a weapon industry, they would also be the backbone of a new agreement. I do not have time to say what worked and what did not. What remained is that the European coal and steel community was considered like a laboratory experiment in cooperation by its actors, like the Marshall Plans OEC, OEEC in earlier years. Coming back to Armenia and Turkey, obviously a process of regional integration does not seem a realistic option today, given that Turkey continues its accession process to the EU and Armenia has decided to join the Eurasian Economic Union. However, could Turkey and Armenia offer a joint project on water to the region, a much needed resource and perhaps not as heatedly disputed as oil or gas? Could there be a meaningful agreement over the fate of a controversial Metsamo nuclear power plant? 
or on how to meet Armenia's energy needs. Those who are specialists of this region will know so much better than I. One fate is clear. The fate of Nagorno-Karabakh stands in the way. In that respect, it is useful to remember that the Coal and Steel Treaty was signed and ratified while France was still occupying the star with no sign of letting go. France and Germany bracketed this issue in a letter attached to the treaty. Three years later, the relationship had changed enough for a referendum to be held in West Germany, and the Saar returned in West Germany. Actually, the referendum was held in the Saar. Can the situation of the Saar be compared to that of Nagorno-Karabakh? Well, the latter is even more difficult. It involves four countries, not to mention Russia, and uh, yeah, three countries, and one is a dictatorship. But could Turkey and Armenia agree to bracket this issue and attempt some tangible cooperation on other issues first? A referendum in Nagorno-Karabakh has been proposed. Displaced Azeris should be allowed to vote in that case. Sadly, the Armenian state has chosen a policy of expulsion, which goes to show how right Hegel was. The work of self-reflection is as important for the former slave as for the former master, or the former slave might be tempted to ape the former master. If the Republic of Turkey and Armenia could get their act together on some imaginative joint and practical project, backed by relatively egalitarian institution, they could play an important bridging role also between the EU and the Eurasian Economic Union, which have failed so lamentably to engage some collaboration, I might say, to the cost of Ukraine. I won't say more now. The last feature of the early years of the communities I wish to mention is that historically small countries have rescued the Union from difficult dilemma. I think of the Benelux countries in 1954. I think of Kosovo, uh, of, uh, excuse me, Slovenia, when Kosovo declared its uh, independence in 2008, which divided the EU deeply. What initiative could Armenians take today? This is not for me to say, of course. I will formulate a wish only. Just as the sanguinary division of Europe struck all Europeans, the disintegration of the Ottoman Empire struck a whole region, politically, economically, and psychologically. Not just Turkey and Armenia. Could some Armenians invite Turks, Syrian, Iraqi, and Lebanese to an ongoing dialogue dialogue about this disintegration, but also about how to imagine a new multi-ethnic, multi-religious space in the region. This could be healing. I conclu in conclusion, I believe that the theoretical and practical experiences of transitional justice could help both parties move beyond a sense of victimhood toward a sense of empowerment because of the realization that their struggles over trials truth-telling and atonement and reparations are those of others as well, albeit in different ways, and that there is much to learn from others' experience as much to contribute. As for European integration, the victim initiated the process. An intricate web was established between cultural behavior, institution, and economic programs. And finally, the small took the initiative. And one question stands today for me. What collective identities do Armenians and Turks wish to choose and to project to the world singly and in connection with each other? You've all been very patient, and I'd like to give you the word. So, if we can collect, if we can collect some questions or comments, if I could ask you to identify uh, who you are, and if I could ask you to be brief, because we have Fiona. How much time do we have? About half an hour. So, uh, the gentleman in the back, standing in the back. Oh, you don't have a mic. Here's the mic. 
My name is David Loud, and I'm a policy analyst. And I would like to know uh, from any of the speakers, and thank you so much for your comments, um, who you might see as serving the essential role of facilitating such a discussion between Armenia and Armenians and Turkey and the Turkish peoples. Because I think that the role that that facilitator will have to play will require such a delicate touch and a, and a sensitivity uh, so as to create a, an, an atmosphere that really uh, produces some results. Another gentleman in back in the green shirt. Thank you. Uh, and I'm Heike Nopet, and I'm a journalist from Armenia. Um, I would like to ask about um, what should Armenia do and Armenians do in terms of their dialogue with, with Turks? This, ha this is a topic we have spoken about uh, today a lot. But it uh, looks like there are two main uh, things, two, two main perspectives that Armenians can pursue. Uh, one is sort of to put aside uh, history and extend hand to Turks and not to politicize the Armenian genocide recognition, but rather to try to engage in so-called constructive dialogue with Turkey. And the second one is to have the Armenian genocide recognition as part of Armenia's political agenda and to pursue this perspective. So I think Armenia tried both. Uh, during the first period of history, it was more like not politicizing Armenian genocide and and not having uh, sort of Armenia as a government supporting the recognition of the Armenian genocide internationally, and then the situation changed. But what was, which one was more effective, and which one uh, you consider, I think Omar Tashpinar referred to this in his uh, speech, so which one we would consider more practical? If Armenia puts aside uh, the Armenian genocide topic, will Turkey be interested in talking to Armenians uh, and reconciling to the Armenian people? At all. And uh, if I may make a brief comment uh, about uh, uh, the fact that genocide as a term is sort of toxic term, and uh, for Turkish society it's kind of harder to swallow to take this. Well, I understand it may be a toxic term, but I think what, um, what uh, sc my opinion, what the scholars and journalists uh, should try to do, particularly in Turkey, is not uh, trying to avoid this term because it's toxic, but maybe trying to showed to the Turkish society that uh, Armenians killed by Turks and Turks killed by Armenians, there, there, there's, it's a two diff very much different dimension. Uh, there are no Armenified Turks, but there were lots of hundreds of thousands of Armenians that were Turkified and Islamized. Armenians lost settlements that used to be cradle of Armenian civilization, Van Mush and elsewhere, but this is not the same for, for Turkey. Armenians lost their, their homeland in 1915. Uh, so I think Maybe we should try to push to pursue uh, this direction of explaining this history to to millions of Turks who may not really be aware of the details of about this. Thank you. Thank you. So following up on that, my comment is also to Amal. Um, uh, I understand, I completely agree with you. As, and someone who is from Turkey, I understand what you're saying about the, about the toxicity of the term itself and, and the importance of context. And definitely I relate to the, to the victimhood. It has been, it's been, actually it has been created from the very moment of the establishment of the Republic. I think it is, um, it's purposefully constructed like that. So Kemalist, there's a legacy of Kemalism in that victimhood idea. But now I think with the AKP uh, government, it has, it has been capitalized in a different way, with more religious, um, a, with an accent to religion. <laughs> with Islamophobia, everything. I'm even blue, I'm sorry. What is it? Tell us. <laughs> yeah, he's I'm, coming. I'm economically uh, I'm Are making pants. <laughs> technically challenged. Okay. It's yeah, not you, it's your phone. Virgin. It's my phone. Okay. Just turn the phone off. I'm going to break it. Okay, I'm just going to continue. So, continue. context, yes. I think there are more and more historians who are paying attention to context and starting the, the narrative 
of what happened to Armenians. Uh, we have heard from Professor Akcham already, but many people would start now, many historians would start from 1912, for instance, the importance of the Balkan Wars and the feelings of revenge that it uh, naturally created among the Muslims who had been expelled uh, from their homelands, basically. So uh, with context, yes, and I do myself always, this is my challenge, uh, has been my challenge. I do pay a lot of attention to context. Uh, uh, because I think it is the solution, really. And bringing in of different actors, such as the great power, their involvement, and how it negatively influenced the faith of Armenians, really, at the end. Uh, but I don't agree, and I don't see your point, in when you make the claim that to make, to, to, to use the term genocide more liberally in relationship to other uh, events that I think are more like ethnic cleansing than genocide, in fact, when you think about the Balkans specifically. So not, not, not just the fact that they don't fit the definition of genocide, but also I don't see it as a solution to the problem of making the term less toxic in Turkey. If nothing else, uh, only because as you point out, and I agree that the Turkish government will not use the term, so it might change the mainstream perception maybe, oh, it happened to them, it happened to us, so what's the big deal really about it type of uh, uh, an attitude. But if the government is afraid or, or afraid of the consequences of naming it as genocide rather than annihilation, ethnic cleansing or even annihilation, so it's not gonna change. We have one more here and we'll have some responses and then do another round. I wonder if uh, there could be a commission, rather than having more uh, studies done on uh, uh, the genocide, uh, the Turkish textbooks, um, the misinformation, disinformation uh, is, is really a, a, a sore spot. And if we could weed out some of that, uh, we might have a better chance at uh, the 80% really understanding and, and not having the wrong impression. For example, we talk about the civil war. A civil war has to have a, a government in and of itself. Like Jefferson Davis was in Richmond, he directed Robert E. Lee. Uh, the Armenians didn't have a, a, a commander in chief. Um, uh, so that sort of thing I think would be extremely important. Uh, we can't keep talking about intercommunal of warfare when there was an intercommunal warfare. You know, the, we need to have the correct terms. We need to train our, 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 our young people uh, with, the, with the proper history. Um, we can't be victims and we can't be, uh, you know, uh, head, head in the uh, clouds. Okay. Let's start with Catherine and then come back this way. Ah. Well, I... <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, I couldn't agree more with you. And uh, actually, does someone know whether there are historian commission on this very issue? But uh, I would just say that this has been a fundamental element of Germany's dealing with yes. its past and its foreign policy. It has had bilateral textbook commissions with most of the victim countries. There's another role that Germany has played, which may be more relevant here, which is for, to facilitate the um, analysis of textbooks, for example, between Israel and Palestine. It was Germany that facilitated that and paid for it. In East Asia, it's been doing work in the Balkans, because there is this institute for, te for the, the textbook research in Braunschweig, which has been around since the 1950s. So if the parties can't necessarily have the impulse to do this themselves, there are international organizations and institutions that have done this in other cases quite successfully. And again, the idea is not to come up with a common history necessarily. And the process is, is as important as the outcome, in fact. So. 
question over here, please. Okay. Um, on the question of uh, symmetry, Turkish victimhood uh, versus Armenian victimhood, uh, what can be done to convey to the Turkish public that there isn't much symmetry, that the Armenians have lost their ancestral homeland, they lost basically uh, uh, places that they considered uh, Armenia, and that Turks at the end of the day established a successful nation state. And there shouldn't be much victimhood given the fact that at the end of the day, with Ataturk, a new republic was born and uh, Turks managed to take their place in history without this sense of victimhood. I, I think on the one hand, we, Tur the Turkish education system tries to imbue that, that sense of confidence uh, uh, in nation building. On the other hand, uh, Turks always have a love and hate relationship with the West. They believe that there is a lack of respect, a lack of empathy uh, uh, coming from the West towards the Turk. The demonization of the Turk, the fact that Turks are not treated by, with respect, the fact that the EU has double standards for Turkey, there is the fact that there's growing Islamophobia in, 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 in the West creates a sense of resentment. And this is, I think, uh, magnified when you have Western governments uh, who call basically what happened to Armenians genocide, but you would not have really a French debate about what happened in Algeria and the killing of one million Arge Al Algerians, a debate about that basically, which would call it a genocide as well. Or attempts by the US Congress to talk about what happened to Native Americans or in Australia, etc. The, the sense that the, the, the fact that the West is not really looking at its own history of nation building, all the things that have happened from the 16th century to the 20th, and that they're, they're blaming the, the Ottomans, the Turks, they're singling them out. That's the perception you get. And that creates a sense of victimhood, I think, a sense of double standard. And it's magnified by the fact that there is in the West a sense of Islamophobia. And there's always the sense that Turks are first portrayed as barbarians, etc. And this government does a good job, the IKP government does a good job in terms of projecting this as they don't hate, they, they don't like us. They don't like the fact that we're, we're, we're a Muslim country. The reason we're, we're not a member of the EU is because we're Muslim. And uh, this uh, emphasis on the Armenian genocide is part of that kind of, that narrative. Now, would it help if you would recognize what happened in the West uh, killings of Muslims in the Balkans as genocide. Would it help, for instance, if uh, uh, there would be more of a symmetry? Well, we have a tangible example in front of us. Does it help to recognize what happened in Srebrenica as genocide? The Turkish government call it, calls it a genocide. The, the West calls it a genocide. I think it, it helps in the sense that you have someone like Etienne Mahchupian, who was up until recently an advisor to the prime minister, who would say, well, isn't it strange that the Turkish government is calling what happened in Srebrenica a genocide, but we're not calling what happened to the Armenians a genocide? Forget 1915, let's take Taner Akçam's process analysis. What happened in Adana in 1909 in itself, 20,000 Armenians being killed in a few days, that in itself is a genocide. Why, not, why should we not call it a genocide? If we call Srebrenica a genocide, let's compare Srebrenica with Adana in 19, 1909. I think it would demystify the term genocide in the eyes of Turkish public opinion. The Turkish public considers genocide as something, the minute they hear genocide, they, they see the finger pointed at them by the West. But the West is reluctant to call what it has done to Muslims a genocide. In the context of Germany, of course, it's different. I mean, you cannot deny what happened to the Jews as a Holocaust. But that's also a kind of difficult symmetry for Turks because when we compare the Holocaust with the Armenian genocide, the Turks immediately say, well, how can you think that the CUP was basically engaged in this kind of racist policy or that the Ottomans had the equivalent of anti-Semitism present in the Third Reich? I mean, you can't compare what happened to the Jews and the systemic 
annihilation in Auschwitz, the, the, basically the, 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 the plan to, to, to uh, uh, kill all Jews to what happened to the, to, to the Armenians. So it immediately triggers this reaction that this, this, these two things are not comparable. And in a way, uh, the Holocaust studies, uh, when, they, when it's compared with the Armenian genocide, it, 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 may, it, it does a disfavor to those who want to talk about the Armenian genocide without the context of Holocaust, because the Holocaust issue basically poisons the whole Turkish attitude towards it, because it brings the, to the floor the question of, okay, if we accept, what, like Germany, what's going to happen? There will be reparations. There will be consequences. How can we get away with recognition of the genocide without a sense of collective guilt, a sense that there has to be consequences, that there will be territorial and financial consequences. So in that sense, I think uh, the whole comparison with the Holocaust is uh, unfortunate, and it, it blocks the debate in Turkey about what happened in 1915. Well, a couple of remarks. I, I think there are, there are two ways a state is willing to have a critical look at its past. One is what help, can you hear me? Yeah. One is the, the method that was exercised against Germany, and that's a total defeat and a complete remolding of its society uh, from the top down. Uh, essentially a situation where its institutions are controlled by outsiders and they are doing something the equivalent of a denazification campaign. And by the way, when we're talking about uh, Turkish state's attitudes toward the Armenian genocide, I think Turkey is not unique in denying its past. Actually, if anything is unique, it's Germany that is unique. The Turkish example is much more common in terms of state's attitudes uh, uh, with regard their, uh, to their own past, including the democracy that you mentioned, with, uh, with considerably you know, bloody hands and bloody histories. So that's, that's one method. And the second method, I think, is for Turkey to liberalize, for the, Turkish, the, the, the process of Turkish modernization to continue, and for things that are uh, impediments to that modernization and liberalization to be minimized. And this brings me to the question of what Armenians can, can do. Well, we sh at, at the very least, Armenians should not do things that make that modernization process more painful that make the liberalization process in Turkey more difficult, right? And recently, I, I had an op-ed in the Washington Post where essentially this was you know, my, my counsel to, to my fellow Armenians. You know, there are, there are a lot of things in the Armenian discourse about Turkey that uh, make it more difficult for Turkey to come to terms with its history, including things like you know, anti-Turkish racism, in some Armenian corners, uh, including things like territorial demands. Uh, I would also add, and this wasn't part of the op-ed, but uh, this is in line with what Omer was saying. I don't think it is very helpful for us to enlist the third parties to pressure Turkey to come to terms with its history. Uh, I know that a lot of Armenian organizations and individual Armenians uh, you know, celebrate every time there is you know, some you know, American state or city or an Italian county or Italian township that recognizes the Armenian genocide. I think it does harm. I know this is not a popular you know, view, especially among my fellow Armenians, but, it, but I, I don't see that necessarily uh, uh, helping the cause of uh, the, the Turkish society moving closer to genocide recognition. If anything, it helps the Turkish nationalists to argue that this is just a continuation of the, the old story and we're being singled out. And look, you know, if we, if we come to terms with this, there are going to be consequences of all sorts. So at the very least, Armenians should avoid doing these things that create impediments on that process or, or create obstacles uh, against that process in Turkey which is slow, which is underway. I don't know how it will end. You know, uh, nobody can be terribly optimistic about that quite yet, but you know, there is a process, and, and I think there are the right and wrong things one can do uh, with respect to that process. As to who could facilitate a dialogue with Armenians, uh, between Armenians and Turks, that was the, the first question that was raised. I don't know what 
the role of facilitators would be. What is it? Armenians and Turks cannot talk to each other and they need facilitators. I, I, I really don't understand the meaning of facilitators. Uh, I think, you know, there are enough rational Armenians and rational Turks that can sit down and talk and they don't need anybody to hold their hand. And if there are Armenians and Turks that don't want to talk to each other, uh, like perhaps our current government or some organizations, no facilitator is going to be able to do anything. So uh, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical about the role of facilitators. They, there isn't anything that they know, facilitators know, that Armenians and Turks don't. Well, quickly, I mean, I, I believe, I agree with Armand, but the facilitators, I think the Turks have to come to grips with what, what happened, and the Armenians should show the kind of understanding that uh, your op-ed in the Washington Post uh, reflected. I think uh, people engage, people do revisionist history when they are secure enough to do revisionist history, when they have self-confidence to do it. It's like individuals. And, I mean, you know, people, people joke about themselves. Those who, who, who do self-deprecating jokes are secure people. Those who engage in self-criticism are secure people. Those who rewrite history and try to, to write it correctly uh, usually are secure enough to do it. In this country, we didn't do this 50 years ago. Look at the movies, look at the popular culture when it comes to the Native Americans or the African Americans or the minorities. And now we are owning what happened. I speak as an American. What happened, what, what we did to the, to the, to the uh, indigenous uh, uh, people. Uh, look how we write today about slavery. Uh, it was, again, wrenching. It's painful. It's not, it's not pleasant. And nobody wants to you know, exercise their own demons. I mean, you know, I, I, I'm very conscious of this because I, I come from a region where nobody wants to dig up you know, the, the, the skulls and, and the ugly history and the mythology and, and to admit that. And, and everybody wants to live in denial and perpetuate all of these mythologies that you know, gives us a sense of you know, refuge because we have a, you know, this aristocracy of pain. We are unique. Our pain is unique. Uh, but only people, I mean, I think the Turks now, I mean, you know, Omar, obviously, you know, infinitely more than me about Turkey. But you, you've seen these in the last few decades, these courageous um, uh, Turkish uh, men of letters and women of letters and scholars and journalists talk about uh, what happened in 1915 openly and honestly. Um, that's a sign of maturity. That's a sign of self-confidence. That's a sign of you know, being secure. And I think we should, we, should, we should encourage these tendencies because it has to come voluntarily. Uh, the, 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 I think the, the, German, the German case is so unique that really not easy to use as, as, as a model. I mean, you know, uh, the, the Germans are the Germans. I studied German philosophy. I know one thing or two about those people. And, and, uh, and it's a great, uh, you know, uh, and it's always fascinated me that, you know, the, the, the country that created Hegel and, 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 and Heidegger, Heidegger himself, for crying out loud, was a Nazi, uh, um, uh, can, can do such a thing, but again, uh, 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 engage in, in self-criticism and, and end up w where it is today. Maybe too pacifist in my mind now. But I always look at South Africa. And again, I'm not sure... You know, uh, 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 I mean, we can have a technical discussion about if a community did uh, mass killings, is th does that amount to genocide because that community does not constitute, quote-unquote, a state? Uh, what do you do with communities that are being encouraged by states or used by states to do mass killing? I mean, that's, a, that, that's an interesting question to do, but I think also uh, communities should engage in, in, uh, in, uh, in self-criticism and introspection. And uh, the American Civil War was unique, so we cannot really compare, again, it's like Germany, you cannot compare it uh, uh, with other communities uh, that engage in, in uh, civil wars. But, um, uh, you know, you, you can't do revisionist history unless you are at a stage where you can deal with the pain of, of, of uh, introspection. Okay. Gentleman here. Um, okay. Uh, 
Germany lost the war and the Nuremberg trials were forced on them and so they really didn't have a whole lot of choice in what they acknowledged or didn't acknowledge. Um, South Africa was under tremendous economic pressure from the whole world that was boycotting them and they had two incredible leaders there. Um, and, and Nelson Mandela and... Um, Lurk. De Klerk, yes, uh, that could have blown up horribly. But so you have pressure from the outside saying, this is true, you can't ignore it. And then you also had, in that case, incredible leaders. Um, I don't see anyone in Turkey just sort of automatically wanting to come up with this. We've already been told that this issue is way down the list. I think that pressure from outside, in, in my opinion, is probably the only reason it has come up as a big issue now. Um, so if you don't think facilitators are a good idea and you don't think that any kind of outside pressure is a good idea and you think that Greeks and uh, uh, Turks and Armenians should just talk to each other, um, how are we really gonna make any pro progress? I mean, the, the winners, the, the people who hold all the power and who oppress the others don't, usually just give it up because they're such nice guys. Or I'm going to ask you a question about uh, identity and how the differing definitions, the evolving definitions of identity in Turkey uh, might assist in this process of examining and coming to terms with shared history. Uh, specifically in terms of the political evolution within Turkey, uh, where the Kurdish, addressing the Kurdish question might provide one route of also addressing the Armenian question. And this has to do with much broader questions of democratic evolution, the upcoming uh, June elections, and whether there's a Kurdish party a Kurdish-based party that comes into parliament that provides the space for addressing, first and foremost, the Kurdish question, which frankly bulks much larger than the Armenian question in Turkey domestically, and as a way to get at that. Um, do you see that as a possible way to encourage this broader societal uh, conversation uh, that gets at the question of a new Turkish identity arising that's not a, a mythical ethno-nationalist one. Uh, Mr. Tasfinar and other apologists for Turkey keep referring to the losses, the Muslim losses, the Turkish losses in the Balkans. Well, what happened in the Balkans was a war, W-A-R, war. And uh, the first Balkan war, the Turkish lost most of its European holdings. The second Balkan war of 13, 1913 was negligible. Well, what happened in 1915 and the years following was not a war, W-A-R. It was outright cleansing, genocide, whatever you want to call it, but there was no war. And I wish he would stop referring to the, the lack of sympathy for the Turkish losses in, in the Balkans, which was a war. We have a lady here, and we'll take responses, and then we'll go to another round. If you could keep your questions or comments brief, that would be... Hi, my name is Vedia Eidelman. I'm a Turkish Jew, and um, I would like to go back to the Holocaust-Armenian genocide comparison. Um, the Germans perfected genocide and the Holocaust is very unique as you all mentioned um, so my question is are the Turks simply uh, afraid of being compared to the Germans and the Holocaust because they're simply ignorant about the definition of genocide as a legal term and that is very general and many s different kinds of acts could fall under the legal term genocide it doesn't have to be uh, as systematic as what the Nazis did. It doesn't have to be an entire population. It doesn't have to even kill part of a population. It just simply needs to 
be an act that leads to their um, destruction in any way. So are the Turks just ignorant about the definition of genocide or is it just too convenient to compare themselves to the Nazis and um, get away with uh, recognizing the actions as genocide? Thank you. Okay, let me try to answer quickly. Oh, we, we have one more question. Well, we have a number of questions. But let's take one more question because it has been patient. Okay. Well. My question is to uh, Professor uh, Catherine Gusson. Um, you made some very nice examples of, uh, you know, uh, such as industrial cooperation, what have you. But you also mentioned something about conducting a referendum about Nagorno-Karabakh. And may I suggest to you that there is only one ethnic group left there, that every Muslim was expelled I as a matter that. of, as a, yes, said that. correct. <laughs> and what do you think the results of such a referendum are going to be in Nagorno-Karabakh? And as far as the uh, gentleman from the audience who made the point about there was no war, <laughs> uh, maybe the Russian army advancing to Van during World War One was on a touristic excursion. I, I think you get a sense of why. Uh, you would have a polarized debate uh, when, you, when you basically try to impose on Turkey that what happened in 1915 uh, uh, is genocide and uh, the ethnic cleansing of Muslims in the Balkans would not be genocide. You would get exactly the same kind of, the, the, that kind of reaction that there has to be a symmetry. I empathize with the Armenian viewpoint that uh, the, the scale the intention, uh, uh, the end uh, the result of what happened in 1915 is in a different category than the ethnic cleansing of Muslims of uh, the Balkans and, and, and Caucasus. Uh, however, it's unavoidable the minute we talk about genocide, this comparison with the Holocaust. We keep coming back to this, and it's unfortunate. But to put a final note on this, in terms of explaining exactly what I mean by the uniqueness of the Holocaust and how it's how comparing the Holocaust with the genocide does a, uh, does a disfavor. In the Holocaust, you don't have really a gray zone. It's black and white. You don't have really uh, a, a, a context of basically Jews taking arms against Germany and trying to establish a state uh, uh, or a Jewish nationalism that wants to uh, establish basically a, a Zionist project in the middle of Germany. The perception of Turkey, and again, I, I, I can understand why, Tanar, you're angry with this argument, but the perception in Turkey is that there were the, the argument that the Armenian uh, rebellions caused uh, this, uh, the, this Turkish policy, that the Armenian, con the context of 1915 is different than the Holocaust because there is a gray area there. The perception in Turkey is that it's a process. As far as I know, the way Hitler justified the genocide was not because there was a Jewish rebellion, but that basically that Jewish blood, Jewish DNA was toxic, and that the Germans should not really, not that? Maybe I'm- That's a bit of a mythology. Okay, let's move on. But my, my sense is that there wasn't really a black and white in the context of the Holocaust. Relativism has ended with the Holocaust. There is no relativism. Whereas in the Armenian context, in the Armenian issue, Turks would immediately give you the context and alleviating circumstances, including war with Russia, including Armenian uh, uh, committees, Armenian nationalism, and that would change the debate. In terms of the other question about uh, whether external dynamics help, if they don't help, and the fact that Turkey is not able to discuss this on its own, how would Turkey come to terms with this? What's, what's the mechanism for Turkey to come to terms? Well, if the mechanism we're looking uh, at is recognition of what happened uh, as a genocide, if this is 
the first step towards reconciliation. If there will be no reconciliation without Turkey acknowledging what happened uh, as genocide, I think we're, 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 in a, we're, we're waiting for one or two generations. It's not gonna happen. It may not happen in my lifetime. What may happen, however, is basically a Turkish government which apologizes for massacres with, with the argument that there won't be compensation, there won't be any uh, uh, financial or territorial compensation, but there will be a formal apology for the events of 1915. This is what I can hope for, to see an apology in my lifetime. And how, when would, would it would happen, it would happen when exactly what Hisham described us, when there is a government that is secure enough to talk about this that doesn't have really this populist instinct of catering to Turkish nationalists, doesn't have this instinct of basically, uh, oh, we're, we're under siege, there's so much pressure on us that if we do this, if we give them an inch, they will ask for a mile. We're not, we're not there yet. The Turkish government, the Turkish people, the Turkish psyche is not healthy enough yet to come to terms with, hap with, with what happened because we're not secure. There's this sense that the Kurdish question, and coming back to Mike's question, the Kurdish question, in my opinion, in a way, exacerbates the Ar Armenia issue because you, you basically insult Abdullah Hocalan for having Armenian blood. Meral Akşener from the, the National uh, Action Party, MHP, said Ermeni dölü. Basically, he has, he's, he has Armenian uh, blood. And that, that's how you treat some of the Kurds for uh, 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 this kind of racist policy. You, 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 you have in the nationalist discourse of Turkey, an attempt to portray basically the Kurds as subservient to Western interests, and they are there to divide the country, just like the Armenians did it in the past. Now you have people like Selahattin Demirtas, now the leader of the Kurdish uh, political party, and I think he would be the only politician in, within the Turkish context who would come close to acknowledging what happened as genocide. And it's not a coincidence. I mean, he's very liberal, he's very democratic, but he's the leader of the Kurdish party. And he doesn't, we're just debating whether he may pass the 10% threshold. Any Turkish politician who would go to the ballot box by saying, I accept what happened in 1915 as genocide, and then I want to solve the Kurdish problem, this, this person would probably not have more than five, six percent of the vote. We're not there yet. The maturity of the Turkish political debate about 1915 is not there yet to recognize what happened as genocide. Maybe massacre, but not genocide. Catherine, you want to just say I just something? want to make a very quick point about the process of German confronting of its past. But for European integration and the context, it would never have happened. Uh, there was a whole context created by uh, the resistance movement reaching out actually to announce there would be, if Germany reformed itself, there would be a united Europe. Anyways, I don't have time to say more. About the referendum, I completely agree with you as the situation is now. I was talking about if the two states managed to get their act together on some concrete project, there might be a time where they trust each other enough to have a referendum which could take into account also the voice of Azeris who can claim coming from that region. We have time or how much time do we have? Yeah, I just want to find out. One more question, so yes. I'm going to make a couple of comments, but short ones. <laughs> in Nazi ideology, the Jews were responsible for Germany's loss in the First World War. They're responsible for socialism. They're responsible for Bolshevism. They're responsible for capitalism. So there's a very strong thing there. Now, Omer's point about this is how Turks perceive. Well, just because Paris Turks perceive, it's doesn't, it doesn't mean it's true, number one. Number two, if reconciliation is the most important thing, so it's because the Turks perceive and they have resistance, then it's the victim that must travel the rest of the way in order to achieve that reconciliation. There must be responsibility for actions that have been taken. And that reconciliation cannot be the ultimate goal if the means to achieve it is for the victim to forget its past, to see all uh, killings equated, to be blamed for things for which they're not responsible, 
And the gray area in the Armenian genocide uh, doesn't exist because we know what happened, number one. And number two, the difference between the Holocaust and the genocide is that the Armenian genocide was strictly rational political calculation. The Holocaust has a very different reason. But the Armenian one is more typical because it has the Turkish leadership resolved a real problem. The German leadership did not resolve a real problem. That's the big difference. But it doesn't make it less of a genocide. This is the last question, comment. Yes. Armin, you began your presentation by saying that uh, genocide has its, uh, its roots in hatred. And I suspect that as long as there's been human society, there have been hatreds. Uh, we tend to think of the Armenian genocide as the first genocide. But given what you've said, I suspect that throughout history, there have been genocides where they're just not recorded as such. Why do we think of the Armenian genocide as the first genocide? Is that just a misnomer, an historical misnomer? Uh, two things. First of all, I wasn't arguing that the Armenian genocide or genocides in general are caused by hatred. I was critical of the theories that ascribe genocides to pure hatred, that ontologically it's hatred and nothing else, that hatred itself is not uh, the consequence of political interaction and political engagement. In fact, I would argue that uh, this is not untrue even in the case of the Holocaust. So when the Holocaust is singled out as the case where it was, it was pure ideology, pure hatred, and there was no political or so socioeconomic interaction, no conflict in German society that could have, uh, could have explained anti-Semitism, et cetera, you know, that is not true either. And if you look at the serious literature on the Holocaust, not the popular literature on the Holocaust, this is disputed very heavily. And you know, the latest book that I've read that I would recommend everybody to read is Esau's Tears by Linderman. And it's, it's a marvelous book, and I, I think everybody should read it. Um, now, um, and I forgot what was the other part of your question. The first genocide thing. I, ne I never called the Armenian genocide the first genocide in history. Yes, I know. I, I think that's. In fact, I'm annoyed when that, that is done. Uh, if there is a first genocide of the 20th century, it was the genocide of the Hereros in Namibia by Germans. Uh, and uh, even if it wasn't the case, I, I kind of don't understand the compulsion to call something the first genocide as if it adds something to its horror or its value. I, I think it's- It's aristocracy it's, of pain. It's, yeah, it's pain. aristocracy of pain kind of uh, attitude and, and I find it uh, objectionable in fact. So I, I, I hope Armenians would, would, would stop calling it the first genocide. Uh, I, I think that the whole aristocracy of pain argument and, and you know the, the, that, that attitude toward um, you know, the, the horrible mass murders in history would, would, would stop. And uh, I think we gain nothing intellectually or politically from creating such hierarchies. And, and I agree with you that it shouldn't be called the first genocide, and it wasn't the first genocide in the 20th century. As far as earlier genocides, I think there is some consensus in the academic literature that genocide is a modern phenomenon because it is related to mass politics and mass nationalism and ethnic cleansing. And, and genocide is not unique in another sense, is that genocide sometimes is the culmination when other efforts to solve the ethnic problem have failed, right? So if assimilation, assimilationist policies have failed somehow, you know, it has escalated to that. But, um, you know, it, it's not phenomenologically unique as, 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 uh, as, as an occurrence, right? It is related to ethnic politics. It is related to mass politics, which is related to modernity. But there are others who dispute these modernity of genocide arguments. Uh, and you, know, you do have cases in, in pre-modern history where you know, groups were targeted as such for extermination. I mean, Carthage comes to mind, for example, or the, the mass murder of 80,000 Roman citizens in Pontus by Mithridates the uh, Tartarus. Uh, so you know, there, there are some cases you can recall in pre-modern history where that has happened. But I still think that there is something 
different about modern genocides, and it is related to mass politics and who controls the state. Related, right? related to the there is, nation there, state. There is a different way we think about the state and a different way we relate to the state today in, in the post-Enlightenment uh, world than, than we did in pre-modern times. And we do have to end, but um, Fiona has asked me to say a few words, and I'd like to do that because a number of things have been said about Germany and to some extent the record needs to be set straight. Um, I do believe the Holocaust was a unique event, um, but Germany perpetrated not just a Holocaust, it also occupied countries, it also uh, pursued an aggressive war against other peoples. Um, have done the same. Sorry? <laughs> Turks have done the same. Well, I'm just saying that it's very important to see the Holocaust as unique, but there are other behaviors um, resulting in the massacre of millions of people. So I think one can learn from that, even though it's unique, one still can draw lessons from unique events. And secondly, I think it's very important to learn to draw some lessons from what Germany did after the Holocaust. And I think there are some universal lessons. So, you know, we, because we say the Holocaust is unique, we then shy away from everything Germany did thereafter and say we have nothing to learn about it. I don't think that's correct. And I think it, there are many lessons. And here there was a reference to collective guilt. You said that, you know, there has to be collective guilt, otherwise there's no movement forward to reconciliation. In fact, Ardenau refused to use the term collective guilt. In the statement he made to the Bundestag in 1951 that began the negotiations over reparations with Israel, the Israelis wanted a statement of collective guilt. I mean, this, was, this statement was important because there was a back and forth between the two parties. It always has to be mutual. He refused to use the term collective guilt. So you could have imagined that the Israelis would have said, okay, you can make whatever statement you want. We're not going to listen to you and we're not going to respond. They didn't do that. And they didn't do that for several reasons. One was a highly pragmatic reason. The Israeli economy was on the basis of, of disaster. And after a major effort to look for funds all over the world, there was the recognition the only place they could go for economic assistance was Germany. And they ultimately negotiated with Germany. Even though there wasn't the statement of collective guilt, can you imagine five, seven years after the Holocaust, Israel still did this? Um, <coughs> the other reason is that I think you know, you, you, there will never be the notion of forgiveness on the part of Israel. There has to be mutuality. What is it that the other side has to give? And I guess this is directed to Armenians. If Turkey does make a statement, it doesn't have to be a formal apology. Ardenauer's statement in 1951 was not actually a formal apology. But what did Israel offer? It was magnanimous. It accepted that a step had been made and this could lead to other steps. And the calculation that was made, when we talk about reparations, it's extremely important. The only country who has received reparations from Germany is Israel. It's a very clear reason for this because the 1953 London Debt Agreement said there would be no reparations from Germany until there were a peace treaty. Germany still hasn't concluded a peace treaty. The unification process was a two plus four process and that was quite deliberate because it didn't want to deal with all these reparations claims. The exception was Israel because the negotiations with Israel had started before the London Debt Conference. But Germany had no legal obligation to pay reparations to Israel. Had no legal obligation because the victims, the state of Israel did, did not exist at the time that the crimes were committed. It did it for moral reasons, it did it for political reasons. So I think this notion of legal, you know, legal, um, you know, legal issues, we, we need to think about this very carefully. And, and the Israeli claim was not for what had been lost. They said, we can never, never, ever calculate what had been lost. The calculation was done on the basis of the number of refugees who ended up in Israel after the Holocaust and how much it cost to absorb each refugee, education, health, and so on. In other words, was even on the Israeli side, there was a creative way of trying to, and 
uh, Catherine and several people referred to Hannah Arendt and imagination. And I think imagination is in very, you know, we, we have a paucity of imagination. And that's why the German case is interesting because even though Germans can be very legalistic on a number of issues, they can also be very, very creative. And often, I have to say, it comes internally from internal sources, but it also comes from outside pressure. So I wouldn't get away completely from the notion um, of, of outside pressure. And you know the, the whole question of the European Union that Catherine Rose, uh, um, referred to and Franco-German relations, that's true. But remember, at the same time that Franco-German relations were being pursued, the relationship with Israel was being pursued. And initially, at least, that had nothing to do with the European community. It did later. What I'm saying in the end, I guess, is that if you look at how Germany dealt with its past, don't talk about the comparison of the event that led to it having to deal with its past. But if you look at how it actually dealt with its past after 1949, there might be contexts are different, histories are different, and so on. But the mechanisms that have allowed some forward movement might be useful. And it's a very, very complicated, long, non-linear process. And I think people tend to put Germany up there as a, as a perfect case, and, and it isn't. Um, so that's what, I would, that's what I would like to leave you with today. I, I, I don't just say this about Germany because I've studied it for so long, but what other cases do we have where a country has fairly successfully dealt with a past of major atrocity? We don't really have anything else. So at least we can look at it. Even if we say that doesn't work, it might make us think a little differently um, because we are in a, we're in a gridlock now. And we, you know, how do we get forward movement? And a number of people have asked that. And I think that is the next step, and that was Gerard's point. We have to now say, where are we? What's, you know, where, where are we? What is the stock taking? How can we move forward? And when we do that, we need to think very, very concretely. And there are some examples internationally that might be helpful. I want to actually thank um, <coughs> Lily um, but particularly for this at the end. And you know, I regret actually we haven't had more time to talk to um, Lily and to, um, have her um, perspective on this. And I just want to make just a couple of observations as we wrap up here. Actually, perhaps it's not um, by chance that there are so many Brits. We <laughs> Brits actually have a lot of atrocities to account for. And one of the reasons that I personally came to this is through Ireland, uh, which is often called the first colony. And if there were some Irish people here today, they might actually give you some choice words about um, genocide in the form of colonization. And I was sitting, um, you know, talking to Lena and, and actually showing her, I went on to Google to actually get the actual date of this. In 2011, when Queen Elizabeth went to Dublin, to the castle that used to be the headquarters of uh, the British uh, presence in an island, I want to say an occupation force, and remember that Ireland was colonized over centuries, and there are massacres and massacres and massacres, often reenacted uh, by the Orange Day. And this, an island, tore my family apart on a regular basis. I have very similar stories to Hisham hearing this. My father and his brother didn't talk for 30 years, and, they've no, and they never talked. My father died without his brother knowing his brother's still alive, we have no contact, all because of the um, Island and the various long and rather unpleasant family history that's related to this. Um, I spent a lot of time, like you actually from age 13, after seeing my father and his brother almost come to blows over various things, deciding that one had to get out of this. And it took Queen Elizabeth um, almost 100 years in 2011, after the um, Easter uprising uh, that my grandfather unfortunately played a role in, <laughs> Uh, on the other side of things, um, to um, go to Ireland and to sort of apologise. Uh, we were looking at the title of this. You know, they said that she, she gave a half apology. She expressed sympathy and sadness mm -hmm. for the atrocities that had been uh, brought uh, upon the Irish people. And it would be very hard to apologise for all of the tragedies of Ireland, the potato famine, the slaughters, the massacres, the invasions, you know, for over, over centuries, but the, but the Queen did a fairly good job at it. And Gerry Adams, uh, one of the leaders of the IRA, accepted that apology uh, for what it was. It was a step. 
And we know that also came through outside pressure from the involvement of the United States and uh, Senator Mitchell, which people are very grateful for in the Good Friday Accords. And it's not over yet. There's still the risk of violence. There's a great deal of concern that with the potential unravelling of the United Kingdom that could happen now in the wake of the recent election with the SNP and uh, a more, let's say, nationalistic English uh, perspective that's uh, brought into British politics, that we could see an unravelling of those accords because they, they came about in the context of a constitutional arrangement within the United Kingdom that kept Northern Ireland there and uh, sort of a shared perspective on economy and history and politics. It's extremely difficult. But the reason that we had this uh, meeting today, and a lot of people have asked us, why is there not a representation of this perspective? Why isn't there a representation of official Armenia or official Turkey or official Azerbaijan or anything else? Is because for the most part, everybody here is a scholar. And as Hisham said, even if you're a journalist, you are the writer, the, the first draft of those history. Because all of us who are historians, like myself, you start off by going back to the journalists of the period who were writing the accounts, the eyewitness accounts, and bearing witness uh, to the events that lead up to what is then uh, becomes history. Even if it's Tacitus and all the other people chronicling things millennia ago, that's the kind of, maybe he's an early journalist like Tom and like Hisham started off and then you know, moved off into, into books. This is how history starts. And many historians play a very important role, people like Tanner in um, opening up documents and getting people to think about things. There are two historians that I studied with at different parts in my career. The one, Dirk Moses, in my undergraduate St. Andrews, who wrote about the genocide of the Aborigines in Australia. And Dirk's book was one of the basis of the Australian government making a formal apology to the Aborigines a very long time later. The British government also apologised many times for deportations of children to my other relatives to Australia and to other um, atrocities that were carried out against the Aborigines, taking their children away from them and putting them in orphanages and families, very similar to some of the things that we hear about. The Aborigines didn't have a lot of political power. That came from actually soul-searching inside of Australia and people like Dirk Moses, my uh, fellow historian and undergraduate, writing books. Another person I studied with at Harvard in uh, graduate school when I did my PhD in history was Carolyn Elkins, an American, who wrote a book about Britain's uh, colonial treatment in Kenya and the Mau Mau Rebellion and the dreadful things that were done against the Kenyans. That actually led to some reparations uh, on, uh, for, the, for the Kenyans, and that was after World War II. And one of my other personal experiences when I was a kid in Cyprus was being... Um, taken by um, a Greek uh, Cypriot boy that I'd been playing with along with my sister to a hillside where he showed me where his grandfather had been incinerated by the British forces during the uprising against the British. That didn't make me feel too good, I can't, I can't say. And this was prior to uh, 1974, I was still a little kid, and I didn't understand this, and I asked my parents, and my parents knew nothing about it. Britain's colonial history was pretty nasty, and that went on right until um, after World War II and went off until the 60s and 70s. And I remember as a kid with my dad watching all of these uh, movies about the, uh, you know, the Rock's Rift. I don't know if any of you ever saw that. About these brave handful of British soldiers showing down the Zulus and massacring thousands of Zulus coming towards them. And a bit later I realised these Zulus were actually people. Fathers, brothers, sons. And we were just like watching them all be slaughtered. You know, so as a Brit, there's actually a lot to come to terms with. And when Lily says, you know, we don't have something on the scale of the Holocaust, we actually have an accumulation in many settings. And as Hisham said, you know, when you become an American like I have and you have, and Lily, you know, you also take on, you know, this um, recognition of a lot of things that happened here as well that we still haven't fully come to terms with. My daughter's learning about the Native Americans at the moment and is a bit shocked that there aren't so many Native Americans around. And Native Americans got reparations through casinos, through all kinds of very strange, uh, basically, forms of uh, the American government coming to terms with things that were done, the abrogation of treaties and the deceit and the betrayal of many of the agreements that were made. So the casinos we see today are a strange kind of reparation. I'm not going to suggest that as a model, but I am going to say that these come in strange forms and we haven't had a full apology. It's absolutely right, because they don't have political power and they are not present in Congress, and they don't have the lobbies that other groups have. So I think there's an awful lot of things that we should take on board. It was why we deliberately picked not political representatives, but scholars, historians, journalists, to start to tell a story. This is only the beginning, we hope, and we do hope that we'll be able to continue, um, as Lily does in, uh, in her work at AICGS uh, on uh, the work of Germany, as Catherine is doing in her research about uh, Europe, 
And that all of us um, here and here in the audience uh, will find ways in which we can uh, keep pursuing uh, this very important topic. And I think all of us, you know, should uh, step back, as everyone has said here, and just take a sober reflection on this issue. We hope that, you know, some of you have taken something away from uh, this today. And I do want to thank all of you for participating. I commend Tom's book and the book of everybody else um, uh, that has uh, been uh, recommended to you. Tom has actually taken on all of these very difficult issues in his book. He's going to have another um, series of uh, seminars uh, uh, that uh, many people will be um, participating in. And we couldn't have really had a, a better chair uh, for this than, uh, than, uh, than Lily. And I hope uh, Lily will have you back again at uh, Brookings uh, to talk a bit more about this example, which is uh, very pertinent. I just want to thank everybody for participating and all of you for staying to the end. Thank you. Thank you.